So this is the traditional um, look at butterflies that we potentially will see um, during the next two days. But these are all the, the butterflies that occur here in this area that we do have a chance to see in, at this time of year. So starting off with the swallowtails, but I have to thank Dave Nunnally for this presentation as well because uh, in the limited time I had to put this together, I, I, I tripped and used some of them. A lot of his slides from previous presentations and, uh, and even the graphics here are our days. So, here is Pinassian, um, not a true swallowtail, but two of the uh, Pinassian species we have. Uh, we have, for sure, the other species, the mountain Pinassian at the top of Mount Howard. In fact, there are large numbers, probably talking about abundance. Uh, I saw some fields this afternoon at the higher uh, parts of, the, uh, of Mount Howard where you just see dots of white flying all over the place and they weren't white butterflies, they were uh, mountain parmesans. Uh, so you, you will see them tomorrow for sure. Clodis parmesan, not so sure. Did you see any Clodis? No. Uh, um, they're usually lower elevation, uh, or maybe at the lower places on, on Sunday we might, we might see them. The difference between the two species, they're very similar as you, you can see. The, the, you look at the antennae and the Clodis has a solid black antenna and uh, the mountain Parnassian has black and white, and so a very simple way of telling, telling the two apart. Uh, the other slide in the middle there was mentioned the sprayus, which is a, an ornament that the male attaches to the female after he's mated with her to make sure another male doesn't mate with her. Swallowtails, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't see any of these up there, but didn't see the old world swallowtail. Lower canyons. Lower canyons. We might see them on Sunday, perhaps. Um, Oregon swallowtail, we should see them here. And uh, they're very similar to the following species, which is the Elise swallowtail. Um, but one of the prime differences is looking at the abdomen, which is basically yellow with a black stripe, and it's reverse in the Elise swallowtail. And also the, the eye spots on the wing there with the Elise swallowtail the black spot is floating free in the middle. But the knee swallowtail, often at high elevations, I didn't see it at Mount Howard. Did not see them, no problem. But they should be there, maybe it's a bit late for them perhaps. Uh, but shouldn't be up there. Swallowtail, so Indra swallowtail. <laughs> we, we, probably too late to see Indra swallowtail, but I put this here because in the books it does say early August, Dana. <laughs> so possibly, you know, we can see them in the swallowtail. You can differentiate them from a least swallowtail because the, the larger area of black, when they're fine, it looks like a, a black swallowtail, basically. Um, Western tiger swallowtails, yes, we will see them at the lower areas, we can see them at the upper elevations, um, but certainly as we were getting on the tram today, we saw Western tiger swallowtail, I think it was that, it might have been the next species, but I think it was the Western tiger. Uh, this is a two-tailed tiger swallowtail, a slightly larger um, species, very similar species, but has two tails. Um, it's the underside and there's the other side. Um, there, you compare the two, there's usually more black on the western tiger swallowtail. Um, when they're flying, you can see quite a lot of black. But with the, the two-tailed swallowtail, it's mostly yellow, very large yellow swallowtail flying by. Uh, and certainly at lower, eleva lower elevations we perhaps will see, should see, um, this species. Um, high old tiger swallowtail, I think I saw one today. You saw it at the top? Okay. High elevation too. So they, they can be at high elevation, also mid elevation anyway. Um, so the whites, the pine white, we're a little bit early for the pine white. I haven't seen any yet. Have you done that in Oregon anyway? Gary picked up uh, pine white uh, recently. I, I've seen them here. So I've seen them here. Summer yeah. Ridge, maybe. Okay, so they're just beginning their fight. Yeah. Okay, so we might see pine whites. Mount Howard is memorable to me um, for, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is um, in 2010, I think it was, we were up at the, the top there, Mount Howard, and pine whites were coming down. They were drifting down from the sky like snowflakes, mm -hmm. uh, literally coming out of the sky. And 
it, it was one of the years where they had their mass eruptions of abundance um, in Oregon in the forests further south. And it appeared that they must have been you know, moved up by winds or upper air currents and then were dropping down over the mountains. Um, so that was, that was a memorable experience to see pine whites dropping down. Um, and that's, so the previous slide was the male, this is the female uh, pine whites, so they've got more orange and more, more markings on the other side. Uh, Becca's white, I guess I'm surprised that they actually put this down. The, the flight, well, we do have a, in some years, a second brood of um, Becca's white that takes it through the summer. And that's certainly happening in Washington, central Washington at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll see them here. Um, certainly not at the top of Mount Howard, I don't think, the lower elevations. Um, um, spring white, another one that, that would be at the end of its, um, end of its flight period, so I doubt that we'd see that as well. Western white, we certainly will see. It's, it's one of the, the commoner butterflies at the top of Mount Howard. Um, it's a, I mean, they don't only occur at tops of mountains, but they seem to particularly like tops of mountains. And, uh, and even the toppest bits of tops of mountains where they, they um, hill top, and uh, males will um, wait for females to come up there and, and make them at the, the very top of the hill. Um, we saw that today, a number of uh, uh, hill, hilly tops. Cabbage white, not so much. At Mount Howard, I saw one as we were driving here. Um, just um, after dinner, before dinner, when we were looking for dinner, <laughs> down a creek, um, looked like a cabbage white to me, so um, ubiquitous butterfly, of course. Uh, this is more typical mountain white butterfly. Um, it was probably the ecological niche that a cabbage white would, um, the margin white, which is uh, this summer brood, lacks any markings at all. It's, it's sort of yellowish on the outside, but inside it's, it's white, pure white. Uh, orange tip again, that's, that's a bit stretching. Uh, but at 10,000 feet, you know, their, jet, their spring emergence could still be operating. But a few weeks ago at the top of Mount Howard, the vegetation was still developing and, uh, and not and just coming to bloom. But in the past two or three weeks, it's come to blue and it's now going the other way and beginning to senesce and it's drying out quite rapidly. So I'm glad we're going up there tomorrow and not in a week or ten days' time um, because the vegetation will be um, almost completely dry by then. Um, so the mustards are probably, I just see a few mustards today, but they're um, beginning to senesce as well. Sulfurs, uh, the orange sulfur, alfalfa butterfly, feeds on our fields of alfalfa can produce thousands of butterflies um, late in the summer in agricultural areas. So it's pretty much a lowland species, but will occur at high elevations too. Um, so this is the clouded sulphur, which is very similar to the orange sulphur, um, but it doesn't have the orange on the inside of the wings, and so the slides aren't showing the inside of the wings. Um, but the orange sulphur has a flash of orange on the, on the forewings, mostly, um, whereas the clouded sulphur um, is usually pure yellow. Um, sulfurs are generally a very difficult group to separate and identify uh, to species. Um, and they're very variable too, which doesn't help. Um, but it's, it's usually looking at the markings on the, on the hind wing, uh, looking at the spots and dots there, um, which uh, tells you which species. And so you can see these two are very similar. And sometimes uh, the orange sulfur doesn't have the orange as much or pronounced um, and, uh, and it can be difficult separating the two at times. But um, I, I saw flying in the distance where I thought might have been missed but I didn't able, wasn't able to catch one. I caught a warm pink head sulphur, which um, I issue too, but I've seen pink head sulphurs up there more commonly than well, I haven't seen polygamy at all. I had to go to Steens Mountain to find polygamy. Um, and I think of polygamy here. Yeah, so you can see. <coughs> polygamy sulphur is a very rare species. It occurs only in the one hours and the Steens Mountain uh, in this part of the world. So um, it's, a, it's a rarity. Uh, whereas the, the pink edge sulphur is, is more widespread, in, particularly in northeast Washington, and you can find them quite commonly. Um, 
But you can see they don't have the other dots that the other solvents had in the earlier slides. So that's one of the identifications. And certainly the solver I had today didn't have the, the other spots around the wing. So, so moving on to coppers. Um, I heard a rumor that you saw these up there. I didn't see any today. Yeah, they're very scarce, but um, I think we came across at least a male and a female over the last couple of days. Okay. So they're, yeah. they're very distinctive, uh, quite large. And they look like a blue, obviously, when they're flying. But, um, the way they fly and their size sort, sort of gives them away uh, as a copper. Um, once you get used to the flight patterns of coppers and blues, uh, they're very, very attractive butterfly, obviously. So we may see a few of those. And then there's the purplish copper, which uh, in previous times at Mount Howard is, is abundant. I didn't see any today. Um, no, you didn't see any either. So that's the underside. Pretty good fly. Very common in most of the Pacific Northwest. So it's a surprise not to see it. It's usually a commonest copper. Lilac border copper. Um, I didn't see any of these. Um, did you see any? Maybe a male today. Really? Okay. They should be up there. <coughs> seen them up here on previous occasions at Top of Mount Hell. Um, saw some a few weeks ago, being Creek Basin, um, and very low numbers again. So I think they're probably having a bad year. But hopefully we'll see one. Mariposa copper. Um, it's usually common at Top of Mount Hell, but I didn't see any up there. I think Dave mentioned he'd seen one at the site. We are going to perhaps on a Sunday, and so hopefully we'll see Mariposa copper um, during the weekend at some point. Um, Edith's copper should be should be around, but I didn't see any of those today. Um, they usually like high elevation areas, and this is well within their range. I don't recall seeing them at Mount Howard in previous times either. So, David. Yes. David. David's got something. Uh, we didn't see on Sunday. We should see them Sunday. Good. I can't see you, so keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so that's the underside of the Edith's copper. Ah, this is the species we won't see, but if it did, it'd win, it'd win something. It'd win the reputation of finding the dim, the third person perhaps to see an American copper um, in the Pacific Northwest. Wow. It's only known from the Willowers, I think, is it? I mean, certainly from Oregon. From That's Oregon, it. yeah. yeah. It's not in Washington, and it was found on Mount Howard. And I haven't seen it, and it's a special butterfly to me because I grew up as a butterfly kid in England, as you can tell from my accent. Um, and this was one of my favorite butterflies growing up. It was common in backyards and, uh, and everywhere. The small copper, it's called in England. And it's the same species. So small. why don't we call it the British copper? We could do it for them, yeah. We'll <laughs> <laughs> change it the British copper. Hair streaks. I didn't see any hair streaks today. Um, but um, I don't know if we're still going to go to Hurricane Creek on Sunday, perhaps not. Um, it's, it's another spot we may go to, which um, they've been reported from. Um, and uh, this is certainly the time they should be flying. And uh, so it's always a nice species to find. Uh, uh, hedgerow hair streak. <coughs> same thicket hair streak too, I think. No? Okay. So Western Pine Off is probably the end of its flight period. Um, more a spring butterfly, um, but high elevations it will occasionally still be flying at this point. I doubt we see that. I think you saw these, right? Huh? Gary, half moon hair straight. Was that on Mount Howard? Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. It's confused with uh, uh, white of our blue, yeah. and when, especially when it's more marked. <coughs> Gary mentioned the one up, ones up there were almost immaculate, without any markings whatsoever. So just a um, grayish brown color line. Um, so, so that's yeah, that's. Uh, Silver hair streak, did you? That might be something with a slightly lower elevation. The ubiquitous grey hair streak, we should see that, and you did see that. Does it talk about how? No, I'm talking about how, but we've seen it regularly throughout the year. Right, yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is a butterfly that is having quite a good year, in my experience this year. It, it's turning up, in, well, it turns up 
in all places anyway, but in, in just the same numbers, if not slightly higher than normal. Uh, it's a survivor again. It can feed on, cannabis can feed on just about any host plant, so it has a great advantage there of uh, not being restricted to any particular food plant. It will feed on just about anything. Um, so it should be common, um, and we should see it, and they'll be shocked if we don't uh, have that in our tally by the end of the, the weekend. So moving on to the blues, western tail blue. Um, I think I saw this today. I saw a Euphilotis species. Um, I'm not an expert on Euphilotis. Uh, Dave is. I, don't, I, I may have kept it for you, Dave, to look at. Um, and it certainly to me looked like a, it was darker than that, duskier, uh, but it was very small um, and struck me as a Euphilotis columbiae. Um, or Columbia Blue. Um, Arabid Blue, very nice blue. I haven't seen any so far this weekend. Um, no. Silvery Blue, um, they're still common in high elevation areas in the Cascades, uh, but I didn't see any here today. One yesterday. One yesterday. Uh, top of Mount Hell? Yep. Okay, it's more common this year than, than normal. Um, so perhaps being a pupa during the winter is to its advantage. Um, Melissa Blue, more lowland species, not going to find that at the top of Mount Held, um, maybe Hurricane Creek. Uh, there's, uh, there's either Melissa in northern Hurricane Creek, and they're not this brightly marked, but they're, uh, I'm not sure which they are. So, greenish blue, definitely I saw uh, Mount Held today. Uh, just a few, not many. Um, Butterflies blue, um, more common blue, um, up there for sure. Again, but not common. Um, like the common, the other name is common blue. In good times, you find lots of them mudding on wet soil. Um, you get quite a spectacular picture. Get them all in the right place at the right time. Uh, Lupin blue, I, I caught one of those on Mount Howard today. Um, it, I, I know on Mount Howard there is a population of Atmon blues, which are very similar to Lupin blues, um, but the Atmon blues of Mount Howard are very different to the Lupin blue that I caught today, which is very much like this one, quite large, um, and the Atmon blue that occurs at a very a much higher elevation. I'm not sure we'll go there tomorrow. I mean, if everyone's really keen, they can go there, but it's quite a way up. Um, and, uh, and I think. Dana and Gary had a look today and didn't actually see it anyway, did you? Uh, Akron, no. So, so I, I, I got this species and I might give it to you, Dave, to actually confirm what it is, perhaps. Um, to differentiate between these two species, it's come down to uh, dissecting out the genitalia to actually be sure if you have an Akron blue or a Lupin blue. Um, that's how difficult it is to tell them apart. Um, but Dave has become an expert at dissecting <laughs> genitalia. <laughs> but it's, it's a skill that is very necessary if we are able to identify these species um, and separate them. And they have, they're very confusing, turning up in different places, different times, totally different habitats. Um, it's just a mess, really, of uh, confusion as to what species you can have between these two in any different location. I, I selected these slides because they are very different um, from each other and they sort of show the extreme mm -hmm. for each um, species perhaps, um, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, if I saw that in the field, it's like a snap on, it looks, it doesn't have the bold spots, but it's something, you know, that's um, warm, whereas this one's fresh, so that's got a lot to do with it, which you can't, mm -hmm. you know, account, I mean, that doesn't, not part of the species identification. Uh, but you can see that the spots are bolder, everything's brighter and bigger, and just the butterfly's bigger too. I mean, they're small blues, but they're, this one's larger than the other one. They're usually diminutive, very, very small. And this is very much like the Atmon, I think, blues that occur at Mount Howard, way up somewhere. And they're feeding on a buckwheat, which I think is, is it very often a flavour that's, that's sort of a yellow flowered. Buckwheat in mountains. What's the species? Flamebloom. Uh, Northern blue, blues, just like the sulfurs, can be very confusing. Um, 
so we'll have a closer look tomorrow. Okay, moving on to one of my more favourite groups of butterflies, the fritillaries, I call them, I can't say it, fritillaries, fritillaries, fritillaries. The great spangled fritillary, um, which is not at the top of Mount Howard, but um, maybe at the elevations we're going to on Sunday, and I know it's a hurricane creek, Dave told me. Um, so hopefully we'll see this spectacular fritillary, one of the largest fritillaries, and the female in particular. The coloration there is, is pretty spectacular. The males are a typical fritillary orange color, um, uh, but they're large uh, and quite unmistakable. Um, uh, Coronis fritillary, I hesitate about putting this in because looking at the distribution maps and things, right on the edge of occurring here. Further to the south, for sure, uh, but it didn't seem to occur, or it didn't occur in the blue mountains, it didn't seem to occur in this part of the Wallows. But I'm pretty sure I saw them today um, as worn individuals. I mean, I'm working on Coronis fritillary in the Cascades and I'm very familiar with the way they wear in the summer and, uh, and that sort of developed an innate sense of identifying them, I guess. Um, and so what I saw today, I, I pretty much bet, were old Coronis fertilities that are in the mountains. Uh, they're usually born in the shrub step or, or lower elevations um, and then come up to the mountains for the summer. Um, and the males follow the females up and get worn ragged looking for the females uh, and then they usually die for the females uh, leave the mountains go back down to low elevations to lay eggs in the autumn. Um, so also, uh, I think Calypia fertility is up there as well. I think Gary mentioned. Did you see? Yeah, I want to say that the, the, the Calypias that we tend to see here, I think, are much uh, a little bit paler and greener. Yeah. And I was, we were sort of assuming that a good portion of those worn butterflies that were wearing tail were Calypias, but that's okay. just been a guess. Okay. Well, but it, cause they're so worn that it was hard to see the yeah. the, the difference between Calypia and Coronis. Look at the one of the differences anyway. The, uh, the spots down there are mostly ovoid or circular, and um, with Calypia, they mm -hmm. tend to be stretched, um, you know, all stretched out. Um, so that really is the only difference, or the major difference, is slight coloration differences from the overall coloration. Um, so, uh, serene fertility, definitely out there today. I saw uh, a few serene fertilities, uh, one of the commonest fertilities throughout the Pacific Northwest. <coughs> um, Hydaspe probably was the commonest fertility at the top of Mount Howard. Um, quite distinctive from the other fertilities because of the ground colour here. It's not a very good picture, but um, they're very purplish brown. Um, once you see them, um, you know, it's, it's easy to separate them from the other fertilities. Um, and my, my youngest daughter's calling them High Daspy now, because their name is Daspy. <laughs> it's a High Daspy. High Daspy. <laughs> and this is one I hope, really hope we'll see. Um, I didn't see today, um, but it's been, I've seen it here before. In fact, this is, well, you know, taxonomically, there's disagreement as to whether this fertility actually exists as a species. Uh, a lot of taxonomists lump it with uh, the following species, Hesperus fertility. Um, but other taxonomists, um, uh, and I, I tend to follow John Pelham, um, not only because he's from Washington, but because he's written the catalogue of, um, of butterflies in North America that most people accept as the, the taxonomic um, basis of the butterflies that we have. Uh, and so, you know, his, his word is, is usually the word that's accepted. And he believes that Atlantis is a separate species. Um, and I've done some rearing work which suggests that it is as well, uh, from the Mount Howard population. So I'm fairly confident that this is a separate species um, that occurs at Mount Howard. <coughs> um, but the main feature about Atlantis, to me, is the amount of darkness, chocolate brown here, um, which I'll compare to Hesperus. The nearest one, you know, because some people think it is the same as Hesperus, it obviously looks like Hesperus. So these are the two that you'll be looking at and trying to separate 
And this one is up there, and I saw it today. <coughs> and there's, there's one location there, near that bowl where we were sitting at lunch, but down the hill to the north. Um, they're down there. They're, they always were down there, and they still are down there. Um, they're like a little enclave of them, and only just flying down there. They are getting fairly warm, which makes things difficult. But um, they're, they're not, as you can see, they're sort of brownish, lightish brown. They have uh, this band here is usually fairly well developed, even more than this in, in a lot of individuals, uh, whereas in Atlantis it's not. And look at this brown here, it's sort of lightish brown, and a lot of white blotches there. But comparing it to here, um, you know, this band is, is there, but it's much thinner, usually. And this is just a richer, darker colour uh, all the way through. Um, and I think it's the Mount Howard populations of everything actually tend to be darker because they're developing up in the mountains and when you develop in the cold you tend to put on more melanin or produce more melanin which is dark material and so butterflies are often darker and that's particularly the case I think with the Atlantis. Do you get silvered and unsilvered with Atlantis? I think so, yeah. With some species like Mormonia, Mormon fertility, you get silvered and unsilvered. And I think these two might be the same. But I think most of them are unsilvered, but certainly these two are. Um, so, so, yeah, these are both occurring together. So this is another reason why I believe they are separate species, because they are living together in the same location. I've reared them, and, uh, and they produce different phenotypes when they emerge. Um, you'd expect if they were the same species to have a mix or, you know, if I read the Hesperus, I've had some so-called Atlantis coming out of the progeny and vice versa, but that doesn't happen. So I believe they're distinct entities. And so I hope we, we get to see Atlantis to them. The other characteristic thing I think about Atlantis is this black border on the other side. Um, some of the other fertilities have, well, they all have a black border of some sort, but none of them have that extent of black border. Um, and maybe it's a feature of Mount Halvey and the melanism and the blackening, and that that's ex exaggerated more than Atlantis in, say, northeast Washington. So I hope you see Atlantis, and we definitely will see Hesperus tomorrow. Um, that's the Hesperus upper side. So you can see it doesn't have the same, well, it has a black border, but not the same, same as you had in Atlantis. Um, it's got a lot of darkening here. And again, that's a function of being a mountain, developing, living, dwelling species throughout its whole life. Um, and funnily enough, even the capitalists are dark too, in this high elevation uh, climate. Um, Great Basin Fertility, I didn't see these today, but I gather you guys did see. So, I, I was, I, I'm convinced that that's the common species that you find on the rocky, dry summit and a lot of the drier areas. Uh, this one? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. So take a look. And yeah, I didn't catch one today. I mean, I didn't wow. catch a lot of them today. Okay. Morning, but so yeah, but you may not have been in the habitat. Right. You were kind of focused on more of the, yeah. the music sites. And, yeah. And, yeah. But I think if you stick to the rocky, rich tops and the top of Mount Howard and okay. any other little, real dry, rocky areas, you will find this. Okay. So, then how, I mean, different subspecies from this species, how do the underside compare to uh, that? I certainly don't have that amount of black here. Yeah, so no, they're, they're pretty dark. I caught one today just so filled from where the well down to pull where the overlook right through there's a knob yeah. right behind the rock yeah. and they're flying all the time back. But yeah, you'll have fun trying to tease out what's what, <laughs> but from, from what you're telling me, there's probably more going on than I was aware of, looking at things a little bit superficially, trying to you know, go broad with moths and butterflies. Yeah, well, you know, Mount Howard is a great place for fertility. I mean, there's five, seven species there. Right? Wow. And so it is a, it is a, a melting pot for fertility. Uh, but usually the Great Basin fertility has this sort of muddish, muddy, greeny sort of tinge, but when they're fresh, Great Basin Fertility. So this is another fertility that you, know, you don't see in most of Washington. You have to come to the Blue Mountains or the Wallowers to see 
Great Basin for tourists. So this is something we, we should look out for tomorrow at the top of Mount Howard. Um, this is common there, the Mormon Futura. Um, and it, it's slightly different from our Washington Futura. It's actually a different subspecies uh, called Erina, uh, where the Washington one is called Washingtonia. Um, and, and as I said before, we have a silvered version and an unsilvered version. Uh, and often there's a bit of greenish to it, so they're, they're quite attractive and different. If you're familiar with um, Washington, more than fertilities, you'll, you'll see that they are quite different. Um, and you'll see them, they're common to our top of our power. Uh, and that's an unsilvered version, and again, a little bit of green. green uh, so, both occur up there, both versions. <coughs> Western meadow fertility, I didn't see any of those today, might be a little bit to uh, wait for them. Um, one of the lesser fertilities, so called. The other ones are called greater fertilities, coming in. It's a different uh, tribe uh, genus, and, uh, and they're generally larger. So these lesser fertilities are generally smaller. Um, this is the only one potentially we could see, um, but I think it's a bit late for that. Um, Northern Checker Spot, I didn't see that today. Probably at lower elevations, perhaps. Uh, maybe in between uh, two generations? No, we don't. Single. Single, yeah. So we should, should be fine, shouldn't we? Uh, it's, it's real early in the world, I believe. Okay. So we'll definitely see these at top now. Have, uh, they will. Uh, not many, just a few. Mm -hmm. um, only females, though, so maybe the males have finished and, and the end in the generation. <coughs> Um, but we should see some of these. These are quite small uh, bill crescents. Uh, my little crescent is something probably not at the top of Mount Howard, more of a riparian area, lower elevation, uh, probably Hurricane Creek if we went there. Um, okay, yes? Okay, we might see one on Sunday. <coughs> um, Northern crescent? No, I didn't see any of those. Uh, not one of the crescents, but it's uh, quite distinctive. Um, should be at the top of Mount Howard. Uh, could be there. Mm -hmm. uh, Snow Green Checkers Spot should be there too, but I didn't see that. That would be a good climb. Um, English Checkers Spot should be here too. But, uh, as I said, I haven't seen any of these vigorous genus species of uh, checker spots. <coughs> So moving on to the true brush foots. Um, commas, Polygonia. I did see a comma of some sort, an angle wing down by the tram, but I wasn't able to see what it was. It's a crash. So you know, these butterflies live a long time and uh, the new generation is just beginning to emerge in some locations. So the hoary comma, the hoary sort of happening on the other side. Uh, we could meet any of those three, but they're just beginning to emerge and they'd be very fresh and very easy to identify if we, if we found them. Uh, but as I said, they are long-lived butterflies and the last year's generation that was born at this time of year is still living in the Washington Cascade. So you've got a mixture of very old and very fresh. Uh, not many very old, uh, not many very fresh either, but the fresh ones will, will uh, soon become the dominant, dominant uh, but this is sort of the lull period. Actually, the, the one we saw was so dark, I thought for a minute it was Laura's angry. <laughs> so we're fine, uh, very quick, I think Jasmine saw it. Um, but it, and it does occur here, it is in the Wallowers. Um, and it also goes in the Blue Mountains, which is where this individual um, was derived from. Um, so this is a, an angle we need to see. But again, it's, it's the time when. Um, the species, the, the old generation is dying off and the new generation hasn't really emerged. Um, California tortoiseshell, in some years when the migration is strong from California, it's common at Mount Howard. Um, this year I've just seen ones and twos. They had boom and bust cycles, so we haven't had a boom cycle for seven years probably. It's a long time since we've seen thousands of them, um, which sometimes we do. And if you go online and Google butterfly migrations or something similar, you'll find a number of videos taken by people climbing up Mount Adams and other volcanoes in the snow and being 
besieged by California tortoiseshells <laughs> flying by. And going, oh my god, look at all these little cool butterflies flying around. Compton tortoiseshell does occur here, but it's, it's a rare butterfly. It occurs in the Blue Mountains, rarely. Uh, it's supposed to occur here. Um, if we wanted to see this, we'd probably go to northeast Washington, where it's reliably seen. Um, it'll be a, a great find if we found Compton tortoiseshell. I don't have another side of this tortoiseshell. It's a large orange butterfly. Um, morning cloak, again, it's another one of the species that's very long lived. Um, it's a new generation is just beginning. It's just emerged. Um, again, it's a butterfly that has boom and bust cycles, and a few years ago it was doing pretty well. Not so much now. Uh, we always saw fire rim tortoiseshell, I might prefer the name for it. Um, yeah, I saw a number of these up at Mount Howell today. Um, freshly emerged, another species that, that goes, um, it's a long lived uh, species, and the new generation is emerging about now, so they're fresh and feeding on the flowers. So we'll see them tomorrow. Um, Painted lady, another species that's a migrant um, cosmopolitan butterfly found throughout the world. Uh, can turn up anywhere at any time. Didn't see any today. Um, so it's possible to see these. But, um, American lady, um, another one that could turn up at any time. Did and, and did yesterday at Mount Howard, a, a very tiny one. Karen was telling me that. Yeah. Oh, Okay, so this, this year they seem to be having a good migration because two weeks ago I found one in uh, Central Cascades on uh, Bear Creek Mountain, uh, which is the first one I've ever seen in Washington. Uh, for, the, for the book that Dave and I wrote, we had to, well, I had to go to Northern California and, and Jasmine was the person that found one female American lady so that we could breed this butterfly for our book. Um, West Coast Lady is in the same bag where they migrate up from California and uh, some years they're quite common, um, often in the Blue Mountains and the Wallowers, but I, didn't, I haven't seen one this year so far. Um, Gary's seen one, you've seen one. Okay, so it's possible to see a West Coast Lady. And I hope you really do, because uh, my youngest daughter, Annabella, I wonder where she got that name from. Um, and her middle name is Vanessa. So she's Annabella Vanessa, and uh, she'd really like to see the butterfly she's named after the estuary. I saw one of these on Mount Spokane Summit yeah. recently, about a month ago, okay. and it was really odd because I had not seen a single uh, painted lady, regular painted lady, right. this year yet. Mm -hmm. And then I saw them uh, two weeks ago in the Elkhorns over at Baker City. Okay. They were, they were there and they were pretty fresh. Oh really? Okay, so so we could see them. Normally at this time this is the time of year when you begin to see them you know, in numbers. So hopefully we'll we will see them. We'll definitely see red animals. We, we saw these today. Um, Gary and I did as well. Um, I think they were flying around the tram, weren't they? The tram shape at the top. Um, we saw one lower down or well, higher up should I say. Um, so red animal. Vanessa Atalanta. Uh, Lord Queen's Admiral, uh, certainly in low elevations, we saw one before we got on the tram, so I bet on Sunday we see, we see some as well. And they have a specialty feeding on uh, animal pieces. Um, and there's a lot of coyote, coyote scat up at Mount Howard, and uh, if we can moisten that, perhaps we can make it attractive for, for butterflies. I don't know how we might moisten it. But... Water. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the monarch, as you can see. Um, I saw a monarch today, not at the top of Mount Howard, down below Lake, driving to Mount Howard, uh, crossing the road, I think, pretty much sure it was. And I think there's uh, milkweed growing around below Lake, Lake Malau, I think you call it. Um, and, and I know. Uh, people have uh, found lardy there recently um, on milkweed around Lake Malawa. So it's in the region. We could come across one at any time. I didn't bring my tax with me, unfortunately. Uh, my wife told me I should bring my tax with me everywhere I go. The satyrids, um, greenlit, one of the most common butterflies in the Pacific Northwest. I haven't seen one this weekend. Not at Mount Howard, no. Um, it's not, not that common this year, actually. Did you see it? They're down around the lake. Down around the lake. Yeah, but I haven't seen them. 
places will be very similar. So we should see. Behind the hotel. Behind the hotel, okay. That's the sort of place they would like. <laughs> Just um, scrubby. A little bit of grass and a little bit of air. They'll be okay. They're a true survivor too, but the numbers seem to be down this year. A uh, common wood dip, um, maybe at lower elevations, not at the top of Mount Howard. Um, no. they, they have this uh, behaviour of uh, going into sort of torpor or dormancy when it gets this time of year, they, they tend to not fly around too much. So they can be around, but just not very active. Um, they're usually quite common. Commonest wood nymph we have. Um, Great Basin wood nymph should occur in this area, but the lower the boat fly rather than, than up the mountains. Um, so possible to see that. But the one we will see at the top of Mount Howard, again, would buy for number one position the most common butterfly up there. And it's the dark wood nymph, um, very common up there today. <coughs> skippers, didn't see any skippers, no skippers on Mount Howard. So whatever that high elevation sort of western branded skipper thing, um, there's a few of those on the summit of Mount Howard and maybe another little high spot along the, the Mount Howard area. So if they are around, they're real zippy and a little hard to uh, spot, but they're around. Okay. So that's the western branded skipper, right? I believe so. <coughs> Certainly, um, should be at lower elevations, perhaps in some areas, but uh, I haven't seen any spectacular skipper if we, if we see these. Uh, um, dusky wings, Perseus dusky wing, uh, little black skipper. Gary, you see one? Where? Not out. Not out, okay. Alright, so there are some skippers up there. I missed them today. Uh, too bad to check the skipper? No. Um, Often seen at mount, on mountain sides, so high elevations. Um, and common shepherd skipper, more low elevation, more weedy type of butterfly, feeds on weeds, as uh, a caterpillar. Um, but, um, no. but the sort of butterfly you probably find around the hotel, like the arena. Uh, and the same with the sooty wing, too, uh, which has been much commoner than, than it seems to be these days. Um, feeds on weeds, obviously. Waste areas, so low elevation perhaps, but it um, occurs here and this is the time to see it, but um, we'll be lucky to see one of these, I think. And the grass skippers, juniper skipper, um, it's possible to see that, um, but um, it's usually spring and autumn flying, and uh, at a high elevation, they, you know, some individuals could still be flying, but didn't see any. Um, but this is the western branded skipper that Dana was mentioning, the subspecies of this that um, is at the top of Mount Howard. So they're very similar to the Western Branded Skipper, but usually at this time of year it will be the Western Branded Skipper line. And, and just a true form, it seems like uh, some of those high elevation uh, Western Branded Skippers are uh, less heavily marked. Okay. The Peck Skipper, I'm surprised to see that that does occur here. <laughs> so it's day, apparently, but I have never seen it here. It's more of a northeastern Washington butterfly, in my opinion. But the Sandhill skipper, um, also possible to see, but I haven't seen it. Uh, Sonoran skipper, another one. Um, so a lot of these skippers are very similar, um, but uh, I don't think we're going to see many skippers at all. Um, woodland skipper, we could see woodlands, so they, yeah, they're beginning to emerge or have been emerging for a couple of weeks now. Um, so we're quite likely to see these, not at the top of Mount Howard, but lower elevations. <clears throat> Very common from now until October. Um, huge populations usually. It'd be interesting to see if their populations are as huge this year as they normally are. See if they uh, suffered any. Uh, maybe not, because they probably they weren't flying when the heat wave occurred, so it would be interesting to see. And the, finally, the common roadside skipper, which um, we walk along the road, people will find. I haven't seen one. Um, and that's the 89 species that we could possibly see. Um, so there's the smallest horde of butterflies 